Right, let's do this. Um, Emma Wright, uh, thank you so much for joining me today on the Ridiculously Human podcast. Oh, you're so welcome. Um, as you know, I've known you for years and it's so lovely to be here and I've been following you and your ridiculously human journey and I just feel like ridiculously human is something that I really resonate with. So thank you so much for having me. No, it's an absolute pleasure. I mean, it, it's, I mean, we've been chatting like nonstop for, for like already 20 minutes almost uh, before the show. And it's like, it's a real cool blast from the past. I must say, um, we were actually colleagues, um, back in the day in, in investment banking, we, we worked for RBS and ABN AMRO. And I must say kind of, for me, it feels like a lifetime ago, although it also feels like really recent because I, I just have great memories of it. Um, I don't know, I don't know what it was like for you. Like if you still have good memories or was it like, is it past life now? Ah, <laughs> oh, that time of my life was the best time. I just, being in the investment bank, I, you know, I moved from Citigroup to RBS at that time and um, working with, in that team just set my career up. I just, it just really was an amazing time. And yeah, I, I look back with such fondness and I'm still in touch with a lot of the people, as you know, we were just talking about, about the, some of the people that we stayed in touch with. And um, yeah, just that opportunity for me and, you know, looking back was kind of a phenomenal step for me to where I am today. Um, I feel very blessed that I kind of got into investment banking as a girl from Bradford <laughs> and then got to meet kind of the, the the inspiring people that I got to meet through that role. Uh, I don't think I would probably be here today if it wasn't for that opportunity. Yeah, I must say we had a we had a really cool team. I, I think about it now, you know, like there was there was some great characters there, and and we worked in some very interesting times. And um, yeah, I mean, you know, and just just really really cool people. I think I think banking kind of gets a bad rap, and, and it especially did, I guess, in our time. Uh, but actually, you know what? I mean, they just everyone is just kind of a normal human being, like trying to earn. Uh, a salary and just trying to do their best and and most people are just really cool nice people normal people you know what I mean and yeah it's it's hard when your industry gets a rap like that and um but but yeah that that's it, it is what it is isn't it yeah absolutely most people that I have had the pleasure of working with in the investment banking time when I was up in London were phenomenal people and everyone wanted to create a positive impact you know um from the products that we launched when we when I moved to the structure product desk you know it was everything that we did was because we really believed and had huge passion for the impact that we could have by the use of what we did in with the financial markets and the clients that we served um but the one of the biggest things that I have a story can I share a story with you right now from from my time when I when I worked with you you might not remember this we had the quote book yes um we had a quote book and we just had banter we just you know we didn't take life seriously from that aspect we had real good relationships we had real good friendships we had the quote book and the banter that we had as colleagues I think that is what really set it apart you know not not everyone gets to have such amazing relationships and I think when you can find joy in your work every single day yeah you know you just jump out of bed and you can't wait to get into work even when you maybe have a hangover the next day or something you know we, we had plenty of those as well so it was a fab time <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yeah, that's a that's a good memory. Eh? I forget that quote book. That was classic. It'd be like someone would say something like either classic or really dumb or something. You're like, all right, we've got to put that in the quote book. Uh, put that in the quote book, and no, you know, it, it, everyone went in the quote book. It was fantastic. It was just really good fun. Um, I, 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 it's a shame we lost it. I don't yeah. think we held on to the quote book. Yeah, it should have been archived. It should have been a eh? <laughs> definitely. Um. It's really interesting like that you say that about like the the sort of vibe between people because when I left investment banking, um, I didn't realize actually how much I enjoyed uh, just going into the office and seeing people. Like it was actually quite a shock to me once I started sort of, you know, trying my own thing and working for myself from home. And I was like, jeepers, I really actually relied on these people for my own sort of um, energy, my own like positivity and happiness and just the banter, you know what I mean? And, and I really, really miss that. And to this day, I still really, really miss seeing people in that office every single day. Oh, absolutely. I look, I, I, lo I often look back because when I left London, I 
and became a chartered financial planner. Um, I didn't have that connection, that that banter. And I felt like, you know, one of the really important things when you're an entrepreneur and you're creating things and you're kind of, you know, designing things and running a business is that you get to go maybe into a space and you get to share those ideas. And one of the amazing things that we had, we had an open plan office. We got to share ideas across the trading floor and across phenomenal expertise. There were people there that knew infinitely more than I did. I was surrounded by people that were way better than me to the side of me, beneath me, all around, you know, and it wasn't ever about competition. You know, it was all about collaboration. I feel really, really blessed that I had that experience and I got to be around people that genuinely supported me, pushed me forwards, wanted me to succeed. And when I stepped into being a business owner, um, I've always really embraced net- networking. And one of the big things that I love to do now as a business owner, as I support entrepreneurs in, in my in my new venture, is to create that space where we can all come together and collaborate. You know, and we, we get to share our wins and we get to ask for things, you know, and ask for help. And raise our challenges because it is a really lonely place if you're doing it on your own and you know I think that's kind of that experience back in the day uh, really set set me up for for loving networking a lot of entrepreneurs don't like networking they fear it they they think something that I have to go and sell but when you when you're kind of used to and you've created that kind of network and you just do it really naturally because you've had that kind of office environment that was really supportive and really encouraged collaboration it sort of just means that it's supernatural and I think that's one of the things that you want when you want when when you're running a business you want all of the things that you do in your business to feel really joyful and natural and not forced um so creating those new habits can be super super important so that you don't feel lonely or feel isolated even when you are in deepest darkest brazil <laughs> <laughs> exactly <laughs> or north devon <laughs> yes it's true <laughs> yeah um it's it's actually um it's amazing how we almost underestimate how powerful networking is like i think okay like i'm i'm just this sort of this very average person at like at, at most things okay but I think the one thing that I that I like well I know that I really enjoy doing and and I think I'm kind of good at it is actually networking and and you know um you know connecting people and just like you know being around people and stuff like that and it is really um such a great skill to have you know and and I guess like now you said, like being an entrepreneur and, and other entrepreneurs not enjoying it, but for you, it's just something that comes supernaturally. You're just going to stand out, you know, and it's going to be so obvious and people are going to be like, wow, I want to, I want to be part of that lady's kind of community and network because I truly believe that the, um, the energy in a room sort of gravitates towards the the sort of higher energy, you know, and if you come in and you're this sort of natural networker and you're like, Hey, everybody, how's it going? Blah, blah, blah. They're like, wow, who's this girl? I want to go and speak to her. You know what I mean? So it's definitely a skill that, um, you know, we maybe take for granted. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you know, there's that famous saying, change your energy, change your life. Um, I went to a networking event on Friday and um, I listened to a, a brilliant talk all about raising your vibrations and your energy. And we did this really great um, kind of thing where we just had to rub our hands together for a bit and then feel the energy. And when you're feeling that you can't do something or it's not for you and you're feeling quite negative about something, your energy is going to lo- lower. And yeah, if you're going out and you're trying to get business or you're trying to market yourself and your vibrations, as you say, or your energy is really low, people aren't going to buy into you. So you do have to really kind of, and it is something maybe I do take for granted, uh, you know, in the fact that I can go into a room and, you know, get really excited because I don't go into a room with an agenda I go into a room to get curious and to bring a really positive energy and learn something and think what can I learn and who can I connect with and one of the challenges I recently gave um, a client of mine who is starting to network and is really not you know feeling quite anxious about it is to not think about who you can go and talk to that you know is to just find one new person that you don't know 
and get really, really enjoy getting curious about that person, asking them about who they are. You know, people like to talk about themselves and they like to tell you about who they are. And they're probably in the same position as you as re- feeling really anxious and nervous. And if you go and talk to them and strike up a conversation, it will it will be a really joyous one and the energy in the room will 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 rise, like you say. And I think that's just one really great tip to just kind of change that kind of perception of that you might want to immediately go into a room where you know everyone. And you know, if you're looking for someone you know and you can't find someone you know, that's really quite anxiety inducing. But if you go into a room at the outset and saying, I don't care about who I know, I actually want to find someone I don't know, you're more likely to go in feeling quite positive about that because your brain's already kind of trusting the fact that it's it's okay to go and talk to strangers and people that you don't know and have that conversation. Um, so I think that 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 for me is something that I've always done. I've always kind of made my my kind of agenda for networking to make one new connection. It doesn't yeah. matter why or how, just making that connection with someone is really important. Yeah, for sure. I think, um, well, we we had this uh, podcast guest on our show. His name is Christopher Maher, really, really fascinating guy. And um, he said something in the podcast that is like literally always stuck with me. And he said, your energy speaks before you do. And I was like, wow, that's so true, you know, because you know it, you can, you can see somebody walk into a room and they can just have this like really grumpy face on or their, their body like postures, like, I don't know, really not great. You know, their shoulders are down or slouched and you're like, oh, this is going to be a toughie. <laughs> you know what I mean? Or there's somebody that comes in they're like, Hey, how's it going? Shoulders back. Um, you know, smiling and that's it. Your, your energy speaks before you do. And it's like, it's such an important thing to remember for all of us. And I think that's why it's really important that we we surround ourselves with with the right energy as well. You know, if you're going into a room um, or if, even if in, in your job or in your career and the energy is not serving you, you don't have to stay. You you know, you, you should surround yourself with the energy that is going to lift you up every day on the, and the people that are positive. You know, positivity breeds positivity. There's too much negativity going in the world. If, you, if you're feeling, you know, in the, in, in the UK, we're having a, a cost of living crisis at the moment. It's all you hear about. Probably if you listen to the news, that negativity is out there. If you, all you hear is negativity, naturally your brain is going to become really, really negative. Whereas if you surround yourself with, well, there's opportunity. And I think this comes from being in the trading market, right? We liked volatility because volatility meant we get better prices and we get opportunity. You know, if the market is just going up steady, 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 and there's no volatility, where's the value? Where Where's the opportunity? Um, you know, when the markets are crashing, that's a buying opportunity, so we like that volatility. We like that ups and downs. And, you know, I think I think kind of surrounding yourself with, with the right energy and surrounding yourself with opportunity and taking yourself out of kind of maybe your comfort zone can be super, super empowering, but it's really can feel feel quite hard to do it when you when you don't know how to or you feel stuck, maybe. Um, you know, especially when it comes to to money and wealth and and all of those things that I love talking about that a lot of people don't like to talk about necessarily. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, we're definitely going to come on to that because um, you have so much uh, knowledge to share in that space. And it's actually, it's from a very different angle that I, that I don't think many people are coming from as well. So I'm really looking forward to diving into that. But I just wanted to maybe tuck in or sort of yeah dive into a little bit of your story. Like you are a really impressive young lady, right? And you've had a phenomenal career. I've always found you um, like sort of fiercely independent, extremely smart and and savvy. And I was just kind of wondering, like, was that kind of always the case for you in your life? Have you always been that sort of person? And And if not, was there something in your life that changed and, you know, just made you become who you are? Firstly, thank you. That's so so kind. I feel quite emotional hearing you say that, you know, as someone who is fiercely independent, you know, hearing somebody else say that that is how you come across is really, really nice to hear. Thank you. But there's a, a big thing for me that stands out from kind of where I am today. And it, you know, it is kind of childhood trauma 
um, my parents split up when I was seven years old and my, my mum and my mum took me to live with my, who is now my stepdad at nine years old. I'd never met before. Um, you know, overnight I, I was taken into an environment that I just didn't want to be. I saw two people fighting over money. Um, and I saw the imbalancement of money where my, you know, my dad used his power and the fact that kind of maybe he had more money at that time compared to my mum that was a lot younger than him um you know use that power to to kind of control the situation and the impact that that I had on me growing up was it was horrendous I didn't enjoy particularly enjoy a huge parts of my childhood and it just meant that basically I threw myself into school I was so lucky to have an amazing teacher growing up um maths teacher that really believed in me and a science teacher that really believed in me I did my maths GCSE a year early and not because I was the best at maths I actually got a B at maths GCSE and then I went on to do a level maths and got a B at a level maths I was never the best grades but I threw my heart and soul into it because potentially my, my childhood wasn't that great. Uh, and at home, I didn't feel like I had that support. And I had a brilliant school, my school was phenomenal. And they really nurtured um, people to, to just really try hard and be the best. And I went then on to to university. And when I went to university, I didn't look back. I didn't want to go back. I didn't want to go back to Bradford. You know, I wanted to, um, it was, at, it was only at university that I discovered um derivatives in my course I didn't even know what a derivative was um and it was through my through my accounting um degree that I discovered trading and the stock exchange and derivatives I didn't learn that at school I learned maths uh, and science <laughs> but what that did for me was is you know I just I never I didn't want to go back to to Bradford I did not want to rely on anybody that independence was I wanted to make my own money I wanted to forge my career and I wanted to be super successful because I wanted to, people to be proud of me and um, fundamentally I didn't really feel that growing up and when I when I got to Manchester and I, I went on to get a first class honours degree in accounting and derivatives I specialized then in derivatives not because I was the best but because I was I just threw myself into the studying and into something that I became really really passionate about I then moved to London and I, I didn't look back and I never ever then had to rely on my dad I was I, you know immediately got a high earning job I immediately was like in a in a career that just had progression I could see progression and I think a lot of young people can't see that progression anymore it's really hard to sometimes see that but I was really fortunate I feel like that you know luck took me in a few places I discovered some things that I really loved at but I was so fiercely independent that I just went for it I put myself forwards I applied for that graduate job that meant that I was going to have to move to London on my own I then you know decided that I didn't want to be in Citigroup I wanted to be in RBS and I went for a, a job that was a big step up again and that's when I got to work with you um, and then you know in that job I was like what's next I was always looking for the next opportunity to progress my career I worked with Neil Saunders I talk a lot about Neil Saunders at the time who just took me under his wing I was really lucky to have really influential men not you know you know there's often a lot of kind of um women in in finance that say you know being a female was really challenging I didn't find that you know I found that being from Bradford with a Yorkshire accent I stood out you know I stood out with that fiercely independent attitude and then I was really lucky to have men around me that just wanted to push me forwards because they saw you know how how passionate I was um so uh, yeah my, my backstory kind of I think you know you could focus on the fact that I had quite a challenging childhood but I didn't take the victim approach I took I just I just took where do I want to be who do I want to be where am I going to get to I want to be a trader I want to be in the front office and I had to get there somehow and and I did <laughs> yeah well that's that's an amazing story and you know, it's it's it was so noticeable when we worked together. You know, I always remember speaking with Matt Ford and going, "Yeah, like Emma, Emma, we're not going to hold on to Emma." I can tell you that she's she's going places. 
Um, and yeah, I mean, it's, it's amazing. It's what you said there is really interesting. Like some people can, uh, have this sort of like, what's it like a, a fixed mindset, right? And what, you know, what could happen, what happened to you could happen to them, but they have this sort of fixed mindset and therefore they just become the victim and their whole life just takes a complete different turn, you know, and, and everything is a struggle, but mindset is so huge, you know, and you obviously like no ways this, this challenge and the struggle, I'm not going to let it get to me. I'm actually going to prove to everybody and to myself that I can make it and I can do it, you know, and that's the, the, the growth mindset is such a great mindset to have because you know, you only look at hurdles like this is just the this is just part of the journey. This is actually, you know, this is not sort of to sort of put me on any sort of detour. This is just part of the journey, and I'm going to deal with this challenge, and let's go for it. And I think um, that's a very sort of strong trait to have. I, uh, you know, I when I when I was in London, I was getting towards the end of my career. They they decided to close down the structured product desk and you know most people sat there and waited for redundancy I didn't wait for redundancy I went and got a job on the credit desk I was like I, I can't sit here and be bored I had to, to take that next step I'm moving desks actually for me as, as an amazing opportunity it was it was what helped me stepping massively out of my comfort zone into a new product credit derivatives is so completely different to what we did in equity stock market derivatives and I was around different people and a different energy. It really made me see what I needed to do next. Um, and it made me realize that I wanted to leave London. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to, I didn't want to wait to retire to North Devon. I wanted to live the North Devon life. And I had to take a big step back at that stage. I had to take a big pay cut. I had to retrain. I had to become a financial planner and then a chartered financial planner, but I had to take a big step back before I could step forwards again. And that can be really nerve wracking because when you're used to living on a certain level of income and your outgoings are a certain kind of lifestyle, that can be quite challenging. But I, I just knew what I wanted. I was really clear actually that I wanted to then be living um, a surfer lifestyle. What was really interesting though, when I moved to North Devon was that I worked harder than ever. And actually I didn't live the life, the kind of the wealth management lifestyle was really hard on me. And, um, it kind of, it wasn't really in alignment with what I enjoyed doing. I felt like I was selling investment solutions and I felt like I had loads of targets I never felt like I had targets in the investment bank it was it was just a different culture and a different vibe it was it wasn't a vibe that I enjoyed that period of time I didn't really enjoy um for a really long time and it was only when I had my little my little boy Harry um I realized do you know what this, this I've got an itch to scratch I've there's something else. I felt like I'd lost my CEO mindset. When I was in, when I was in structured products, Neil just really pushed me out of my comfort zone. He just, you know, and so did Matt, everyone, you guys, you were just like, get out there and go and do this. You've got it. You know, um, I got to do conferences to thousands of people. I was leading the sales of multi-million pound deals. I was launching and closing trades. Um, you know, I was, I was, you know, in charge of one of the most innovative products in the structured product market that won a mul multiple awards with with Neil when we when we created the first dividend income product. I was CEO. He was supporting me to be much bigger than my probably my station commanded. You know, as as someone quite junior on the desk. When I moved into wealth management, it just didn't, I felt like I had targets and it was all about how many assets can you bring in and how many sales can you do and how many people can you see? I didn't, I just didn't enjoy it. And I have, when I had Harry, I was like, I want to work for myself. I just want to be my own boss. And I really, I was like, I can't do it though. I didn't see how I could do it. And I, I didn't, feel like it was possible it's really hard to run a business how can I find clients and I just didn't really know what to do um and I it took some you know a lot of work and meeting pe people that could in help me to inspire me to to show me how to do that and having Harry was like the wake-up call I needed because I just realized I couldn't do that once I broke free once I kind of 
kind of really, you know, seeing how I could run a business and actually see that I could design a business that really lit me up every day that I could do for my home office where I'm not driving millions of miles polluting the planet. Um, and I can walk to and from school every day and pick him up and I can go surfing and go paddleboarding at the weekends and on the evenings and li like live my best life and run a business that makes me more money than I need. That was, that was exciting. That's when I realized this is my purpose. This is what it was all meant to lead me to so that I could farm my own business and create the impact that I want to have but it's been quite a journey to get here. <laughs> yeah, for sure. I mean, it's it's not to be underestimated that transition, you know, like going from working for a corporate uh, business and um, then trying to set up your own, own business, you know, not having that comfort zone of monthly income, not having the the people around you, the support network, um, just the, yeah, the, the I guess the kind of like, just what you used to, you know, not having that and, and, and change, you know, change doesn't come naturally to so many people, you know, and, and moving out of your comfort zone. I mean, it's, it's hard for, for, for everyone, you know, and change is never easy. And, but it is so important to do, you know, like doing hard things, getting comfortable with being uncomfortable are things that you should seek. I think, I believe, because otherwise you've just become stale. And you, you, you don't, you don't become who you meant to be, you know, like we were chatting before this about how powerful humans actually are, you know, how, how much potential we actually all hold, but, but so many of us don't even realize it because we're fearful and we are also lazy, I believe, I think, you know, and we just kind of like, oh yeah, cool. I'm just going to carry on like this. Cause you know, I, I get my few holidays a year and that's good enough for me and I pay the bills and whatnot. And that's actually quite a sad existence, isn't it? I just think, you know, human beings being ridiculously human means constantly stepping out of your comfort zone. Look back to how nature created us. We were meant to go fight the lions, go out hunting every day. We were meant to be getting that kind of cortisol hit to then have that dopamine hit. And that's what makes us human. And we have been throughout kind of how society has changed us. We've become human doings, not human beings. We've become, you know, put into the system where we go to school and then you have to get a job and then you have to work for 30 to 40 years. And then maybe you can retire and start living. I'm not going to be that human doing person. And I don't, all the people that work with me, I really encourage them to become human beings again, to start living their life first, to say, what do I want from my life today? You know, not 20 years time when you might retire. What is financial independence to you? What is your life all about? What do you want to get from your life? And I did that for myself when I created this business. And that's what I live and breathe to do. So I can live and breathe and help other people to do it as well. I about um yeah, about about 12 months ago, I I'd obviously launched my business, but I really got really clear again on what my mission is. My mission is to help reduce the climate crisis one pound at a time. I really feel like back when I was meant to go to uni, I nearly became a marine biologist before I took financial derivatives. And that's because I have always had this inner desire to work in the ocean, to help preserve the beautiful planet, to stop the things that are happening even before the marine biology. Um, and when I did triple science, um, you know, when I was kind of like doing the, the kind of the, the mental work to learn about biology, chemistry, and all of the things that you need to know. I wrote to, to the government at like the age of 10, asking them why they were destroying our planet. And I, they sent me a pack to help me to join the World Wildlife Foundation. Thank you. Very helpful. <laughs> I've always had this, but I didn't really notice it at the time. I didn't notice that I had this burning itch to scratch it wasn't just about launching my business it was so much more than that and I got really clear on my purpose and that led me to setting some pretty important life-changing goals that run alongside my business my business is the means to my life and the impact that I want to have 
And so I started to do my scuba paddy this year. Um, and I just, you know, for years, I have wanted to swim with dolphins. And it's never happened. Why has it never happened? Because I don't believe that it's going to happen to me. I don't believe that I'm going to swim with dolphins. So how can I change this belief? How can I change this mindset and start living my life today? I've had children. I'm never going to get to the Maldives now because children, taking children to the Maldives is just really challenging, right? And this is it all again, all a, a mindset and a limiting belief that I had. I live in North Devon. I want to do my scuba paddy. I found easy divers in Ilfracombe. And by the end of the summer, well, by August, I'm going to be swimming with seals, underwater scuba diving. And I it terrifies me. Still now, the thought of swimming with the thing in my mouth underwater terrifies me. People say, I don't know how you can do it. You know, it's really, really risky. You don't take risks. You don't get the rewards. And I'm learning it with an amazing expert and I'm learning, learning with an, a group of other people that have this amazing goal to be in at Lundy Island swimming with, with the seals so that then I can maybe come to places like Brazil and, you know, hot places and swim and be at, you know, having the opportunity to swim with dolphins and whales and orcas and sharks and then start doing some conservation. Um, but it's only when I got really clear on my purpose, like 12 months ago again, that I realized what I needed to be doing in my life. And then how do I need to do that? in my, What do I need to do in my business to, to make the money to give me that life and that impact? <laughs> and, I, and I think that's like such an amazing uh, lesson or advice for people that are sort of going their own way because my my sort of um experience of it is is that you start off with what you think you're going to do right and actually no it becomes something very different you know like like i actually thought i was going to get into sort of high end um personal training um and i went and i did all these sort of things around fitness but also around um, being a chef and yoga and meditation, blah, blah, blah. And it wasn't until I did my final sort of like bit of studying, which was actually executive coaching that I went, actually, you know what? I don't really want to do all those other things. Um, I want to do the sort of executive life coaching. That's where I just feel I can provide more value to people. And it's, so you have to actually keep, be very flexible and very adaptable on your own journey because the idea that you start out with is probably going to change because, you know, you, you're effectively starting fresh, you know, so you're actually going to be finding out new information as you go along. And as long as you're conscious and you're open to kind of changing and, and adapting, then you will eventually find what it is, you know, and I think that's a very good piece of advice for people, what you said there, like, like, you know, you're going to sort of evolve and, and your purpose might not be entirely clear at the beginning, but at some point you're going to go, aha, there it is. Life's a journey, not a destination, isn't it? And we get so fixated on the destination that we forget to have the journey and enjoying the journey as well. And I think that's really, really important. You know, I, I love trying to be really present in the moment, you know, enjoying the experience right now and when I scuba when you go underwater you have to focus on your breathing and you have to you take in in that moment nothing else you can't hear anything it's all sign language under the water and that's really helped me because for someone whose brain is all over the place you know I have so many thoughts and we we have that right and that's where anxiety comes from and and I, by the way I think it's so important we think that being anxious, we have to be anxious. We don't have to be anxious. We can learn to actually free ourselves from anxiety and be present because we're not chasing the destination. We're enjoying the journey along the way. It's great to have a destination and be aware of where you want to be in the future. But when you when you get really clear on what you want to from your life in the present moment, that's really, really empowering. And for me, it keeps it keeps pivoting and moving that's transformational when you can pivot and when you can change and when you get really confident about just doing something different that's how you can become really really 
flexible. It's how you can navigate uncertainties, the ups and downs, um, you know, the roller coaster that life can be, or the stock market, or the economy, all of these things, these life's little hurdles, you'll be, be able to clear those hurdles. You might trip over a hurdle, you'll be able to pick yourself up because life can be can be hard as well. You know, not everything's a straight line. I think that can, I think that is what makes you succeed today in life when you when you kind of embrace that one of the biggest things that we get challenged with though I think as well is when we invest a huge amount of money in a course or a program because we want to become a yoga instructor or we maybe want to become a breathwork coach or we want to become a life coach or we want to do this thing and we invest in it and then we think well I've, I've, I've made that investment that is now what I need to do and that can keep you stuck if you realize you don't like it. Why don't we see more of these things as investment into personal development? Or actually, it's an investment in growth that can be transformative because I understand yoga or I understand this thing for myself and I can, you know, do all of these amazing things for myself. It doesn't mean that you have to stay committed. There's something in accounting called sunk cost. When we realize that it's a sunk cost, it doesn't matter, even if you've invested massively in a business that you want to launch, and then you realize that it's actually, it's not what you like anymore. That's okay. You can change, giving yourself permission to just be flexible. You know, in in, in the States, um, they really embrace businesses that have um, folded or that haven't worked out, that have gone bankrupt. Bankruptcy in America is just really normal. In the UK, if you go bankrupt, you are like this, it's like sinful. So we keep going in difficult situations. We don't get get ourselves out of situations by making the right decision to maybe close a company or fold a company or letting something go into um, administration because it's not working out. And actually we want to do something different. If we get comfortable in failures our lessons from failures are not necessarily even being a failure it's been a lesson and we decided to go down a different path that's really freeing and we can make better decisions moving forward for ourselves and that's really important isn't it making decisions for ourselves not for everyone around us as well bringing joy to to ourselves um so that we can be the best person we can be for everyone else around us <laughs> yeah yes there's so much in there you know and I think that that is like it's almost like what one one of the things you mentioned there about people almost holding on to things you know because they feel they need to kind of see it out or write it out or to be successful that really that's almost like your ego isn't it like I've I'm gonna I'm going to do this and it's going to be successful. But meanwhile, you, you're plowing more money into it and more money and effectively you're just getting more in debt and more stressed. And, you know, sometimes you just have to go, uh, -uh I've just got to take this as a hit and I must move on. And that is amazing advice. Like seriously, like more people must do that. You know, that sunken cost, whatever you, 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 you take it you learn the lessons and you're like, cool, what's the next thing now? Because otherwise you just, you really can destroy your life. But there's two parts to our, to our body. There's the ego self and then there's the spirit self. And your ego is there to keep you safe, to keep your basic, basic needs met. And without your ego, your spirit can't exist. Um, and so naturally your body wants to keep you in your comfort zone. It wants to keep you safe. But we have to always be reassuring to the ego that there's something else that's greater, that we can do things differently, that we can take informed decisions outside of our comfort zone. And fundamentally, if you can keep your ego in trust, you know, and you can show your ego the way forwards, you know, we have to nurture our egos. Our egos are really important. But fundamentally, unless you step out of your comfort zone, unless you step into that spirit self, unless you kind of see what your purpose is and you kind of take yourself forwards, you're never going to feel satisfied. You're always going to be kind of wondering, well, what if I did that? What if I took that bold step of closing that business or leaving that employment and going into entrepreneurship or 
that next venture move into another country. You know, I work with a lot of people that don't want to be in the UK anymore. Right? They don't want to be, um, you know, uh, kind of, they want to be free. They want to work from anywhere, but then they never do it. My dad did that. My dad always wanted to retire to Spain. He's never done it. <laughs> He never retired in Spain. Um, I never want to be like that. I really want to. And I want this for my children as well. I want my children to be inspired to live wherever they want to live on this beautiful planet. We're so lucky to have this earth. You know, we we're talking about aliens, weren't we, before we came on air? We, there's, there's no sign of life anywhere else in the whole like universe, galaxies. You know, it blows my mind a little bit. We have this planet that lives in this balanced, perfect ecosystem with gorgeous beaches, beautiful ice, snow, mountains. And then we're not living. We're like on stuck on the tube every day going into London or stuck in our car. You know, that's not what life's about. We have a far greater purpose and a far greater reason for being on this planet than just doing what we sh we've been conditioned to do by maybe by the government and society and kind of the people that want to keep us stuck. I really believe that the more we can get entrepreneurs to launch their business ventures, the more that the wealth gap will, will not, you know, the, the wealth gap will not widen anymore. It's why being widened by corporates getting more and more of the wealth, more of the workers doing all of the, the work for the corporates. We need more of those workers to step out, create entrepreneurships where they can hire some of those people that maybe don't want to run their own businesses. That is how the wealth gap can, the distribution of wealth can be, can be shared and we can have a, you know, it's, I, I really believe that that's how we can er, eradicate poverty and stop people from living in what we, you know, what we feel like is the, the poverty state that we're all experiencing around the world at the minute. Um, yeah, I get a bit, I get a bit excited about and passionate about this. <laughs> no, no, that's what we, that's what we like. That's what we here for, you know. Um, so, so it's it's really it's not it's a nice segue because um, I think people don't actually talk about money enough, right? In in terms of like, not like you know, you get you get people that talk about it too much, where they they're actually just insecure people trying to show off and prove themselves. But we don't actually talk about it enough, like you know, sort of the the mindset around money, the um, how it kind of governs our our decision making, um, the struggles it might might cause us. Um, how do you just have a better relationship with money? Now, you mentioned um, in one of your blog articles how when you were working in investment banking, um, you were you know you were earning great money, but you were just hemorrhaging cash, kind of left, right, and center. You know, and I assume that's like partly lifestyle, um, partly just maybe not um, being sort of aware of, you know, maybe how to manage money that well. What was it for you that kind of like changed that, like changed the mindset, changed the understanding and knowledge um, for you to, yeah, obviously now step into where you are now? Oh, your relationship with your money um, is so important. Um you know, when I look back on my own relationship with money, I didn't realize that, you know, although I was fiercely independent, I was, my, my success was being pushed forward by my experiences growing up around, around money. I also um, felt like, you know, I had to spend money to, to prove my success. You know, I had to treat people to holidays. I had to, you know, I always wanted to take buy things nice things for my for my family because then you know I had to money for me was a way of buying love because maybe I didn't feel worthy enough because growing up I didn't feel like I was loved you know always loved uh, or was always good enough um and you know for me taking that deep dive into my own money story was really really telling I realized that actually I don't need a huge amount of money to be happy um you know it costs me nothing maybe it's quite expensive parking down at the beach <laughs> 10 pounds to park down at marine drive you know fundamentally i don't need huge amounts of money to live uh, an incredible life but i do want to earn money and i do want to earn good money because i really do believe as well that the more money you can have the more of an impact you can make 
um, you know, we can do greater things. We can put into charities that we support. We can go on things that we really believe about. And it was only when I really realized that how I was treating money, um, you know, through, you know, through spending and through lifestyle, I was, I wasn't really living a good life back then I didn't really go to, I, I paid for a really expensive gym membership but I wasn't going going to yoga and being mindful I was going because I felt like I had to get thin or I was um you know it, it was funny when I look back actually because I didn't eat very well when I was in London I used to you know get a, a, a very expensive coffee on the way in I'd buy a bacon sandwich from the canteen I'd then have a burrito at lunch I'd then have a, a lot of drinks and probably chips on the way home I was hemorrhaging money because of my lifestyle was quite poor since I've kind of moved and moved to North Devon and I you know I I eat a really good breakfast I eat fresh food I, I you know I don't eat processed food I try to make my own lunches because I am living working from home. I'm I'm so much more mindful of what I do with my money now. And I think the way that you treat your life is also how you treat money. And seeing that has been really transformative for me because I, you know, I'm a financial planner. So I will create financial plans. And then I'm like, well, why do my clients still not deliver on those financial plans? It's because they they, the way that they live is how they treat money and it's a mirror reflection. And when you go back and look at people's beliefs and how they've grown up believing about themselves, believing, you know, I, I'm not deserve, I'm not worthy of wealth, maybe. I'm not worthy of having money. Um, I don't deserve to, um, to, to charge that price for my program. When you can get really deep, on the beliefs that you maybe had from a really young age, you can create, you can kind of re reveal a lot about your relationship with your money. You can bring those beliefs to the surface and then you can take some really empowered actions to, to rewrite your own narrative. And that's what I did. I've been through this whole process for myself. That's what I do with my clients. You know, I'm a chartered financial planner, but if you don't have the right mindset, you won't do the strategy, you won't launch the business, or you might, it'll take you a lot longer than if you believe that you can at the same time. So, you know, I, I love talking about money, because I think it shouldn't be taboo, that we should be able to confidently say what we charge and why we charge what we charge for. You know, I don't necessarily believe we have to go and talk about wanting hundred thousand pound businesses or million pound businesses you know there is still potentially that ego vulgar side to money that I necessarily don't think that we have to be like but we can get really confident having money conversations so many relationships fail because we don't have conversations with our partners about money and because we feel really dirty talking about money money isn't vulgar money isn't dirty Money isn't the root of all evil. It's what you do with it that matters, right? It's the energy you put behind it. And if more good people have money and rich people become amazing, good, thriller, I can never say that word. You know what I'm trying to say. Philanthropists. Um, good, that's it. If more people have, more people kind of have money and can become the changers, then the planet would be a far greater place. It's not the money's fault. It's what we do with it that really matters. Everything that you're saying keeps on coming back to mindset, doesn't it? And it's so amazing. Like you are a wealth manager, financial advisor, but actually it seems like what you teach your clients is literally you've got to get your mindset right. Um, and then we follow on from there. Is that kind of how it works for you? Uh, so yeah, so I try and now work with really early stage businesses. I've worked with, well, I work with all kinds of businesses now, business owners. Um, and some of the people that have started to create big, big businesses, you know, multi six figure into seven figure businesses, their habits have really embedded the bad habits. You know, they're not looking after their money. They're not 
they don't see the wood from the trees. It's like the matrix. They can't see where the money's going and the habits that they might have in their personal life or in their business. They're not on top of their cash flow. So for me, the mindset part and the habits you form, you know, getting really confident that you you can do numbers. You know, so many of my clients had really bad experiences with, with their teachers at school where they were told maybe because they had dyslexia or ADHD or, or you know, kind of some of those um, challenges growing up. They're told that you are bad with money. And when you think I am bad with money or I'm bad with numbers, that plays out then in your business and your life. And then you don't hold on to wealth. So a big part of what I do is getting people to really believe that anybody is good with money. We are all good with money. We can, you know, we can all have more money than we need. We can all do great things with the money that we make. We can become investors because investing your money is super easy. You just need to know how. It's like opening a bank account. And I I really believe in um, rather than, you know, disempowering people with financial advice where I go and do it for them I don't do that anymore I don't do that because that is disempowering I massively empower my clients to do as much for themselves as possible so that they start to love money they start to love the process of managing their money and they're creating habits that are really healthy. That's why I like to work with early stage businesses because they're, they're building a business. They haven't necessarily got into some of the bad habits that they might have if they'd have got to a bigger phase of business um, so that they can start to think about, you know, what should they be charging for their products and what sort of clients do they want to have? And then what are the processes and systems they can put, put in place for their money? And then what do they want to do with that money? What's the lifestyle? What's the intention? It's all connected so it's it's really holistic it's really bespoke it's it's and it's super transformational um you know I just I just I get one of the best bits of feedback I got from a client was I get really excited about other people's money because I could see if they got these things in place whoa what life are you gonna have and what impact is the planet gonna have by you bringing this amazing service out there you know, by bringing your talent out there and by by going out and spending money on a massage, if that's what you want to have, because you're giving that to, to a masseuse that needs your service as well. It's it's a ripple effect. In, you know, I really believe that we, we talked about this before we came on air, didn't we? Um, we? We talked about the fact that as individuals, we don't think that we can have impact because we're just one person in a pond of billions or millions of people around the world. We can have a huge impact. You know, if we all do what we want to do in life that we really believe in, that ripple is massive um, and it just can can be profound. So it, There's this really cool, it reminds me of this really cool meme that I saw. It's like, it's kind of like, kind of linked to what you're saying, but it's it's like the, the people that rule us, right? It's like there's, there's very few of them and it's this, so it's the school of fish and it's like this one like sort of big fish that sort of, um, attacking all the little fish and the little fish are swimming away but then in the second part of the the meme it's like okay no the fish the fish have changed their mind and they've like all turned around on this kind of like big fish and they're like okay actually we're together we're so powerful you know what I mean we'll take you on and I think it's really interesting because I think about this a lot I think that we're in this really strange time right now right where um humans are almost being sort of like split up into these smaller groups, okay? And we become very cultish about it, you know? And 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 that is uh, damaging to us as a collective community, to our collective consciousness. And it's something we kind of really need to repair. Um, I, I think that the... Oh, this is kind of, these are thoughts that I'm formulating at the moment still, you know, so I, I feel like that you have this personal branding uh, movements, which has probably been going on for like five to 10 years. That's almost having this kind of like negative impact on how we operate as humans, because personal branding has become such a big thing 
that we forget about, okay, what can we actually do together? Like, how can we collaborate? How can I help you? How can you help me? How can we put our personal branding aside and how can we actually, um, you know, maybe start a business together or start some venture or whatever it is. And I feel it's something that, you know, people like you are probably trying to shift, you know, you're trying to trying to shift that consciousness and you're trying to be like, come on, let's, uh, let's realize that we, uh, we're all humans. We all here to, um, you know, to have better lives. Let's kind of, um, let's do it. Let's do it together. Um, so yeah. I love that. I think that's, that's just really inspired me to, um, just think again about everything that I'm doing, because fundamentally when I started, um, you know, over two years ago, Ro- Baby Rose is two now. And um, when I when I started two years ago, my business was called Emma Wright Coaching. And when I relaunched my business six months ago, I was like, it's not about me. I don't want it to be about me. I'm not important in the brand that I'm building. Actually, I want to build a brand that's about about everything else, about everybody else. And so I created Independent Wealth. So I took my name out of my brand and independent wealth stands for independence of everyone collectively. But fundamentally, the only way that we can work is if we collaborate and we, you know, that's why, that's why I love entrepreneurship because, you know, fundamentally my business success, I always say that I'm a net referrer. I'm a net referrer because I work with clients, but then fundamentally my clients are going to need an accountant. They are going to need specialist advice. They are going to need a will writer or an estate planner. They are going to need a marketer, a social media manager. They are going to need, you know, all of these different things that their business and that creates a web of opportunity. I do what I do. I have an amazing person that's going to do this. I might hire people into my business eventually to, to do other things that, in the business that we want to do at independent wealth you know it's that web of opportunity and when we start trading with each other that's like when we what it was back in you know back in the olden days when we were in a village and I grew the carrots and someone else grew grew the cauliflower and the spinach and you know we we traded commodities that's I think that is really power, empowering to think that we can actually stop having silos but really be collective and collaborative and supportive and surround ourselves with people that are better than us again. And it goes back to how it was when we were in the investment banking days, when we really did genuinely collaborate to create phenomenal results for ourselves and for the bank, obviously, and for our clients and, um, you know, fundamentally what you've just said is it's, it's so true that if we just work in silos and we don't work together that is really hard. You're never gonna, you're never gonna think that you're at the right place to launch your business if you have to be the best at everything as well. And when you when you kind of think, what am I really good at? And then how can I collaborate or what who can I collaborate with? You'll get really confident and then you'll be able to kind of have a much bigger impact. Absolutely believe in that. It's phenomenal. <laughs> Love that. <laughs> I think I think that a lot of this is happening already, actually. Like so. I mean, you know, humans, the cool thing about humans is that we are emotional beings and we actually, we're kind of the same as we were, you know, I don't know, whenever we started existing, I don't know, a few hundred thousand years ago, right? We, 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 the same sort of, um, we think kind of the same way, you know? So the society that we live in, because it's really controlled, you know, well, you know, it, it feels like it's really controlled, you know, and it's like very centralized and you must do what the government says and blah, 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 blah. Um, ultimately, like there's something inside us which goes, uh-uh, you know what? Like we will handle and we'll tolerate a, a certain amount, but but we have our limits, you know, we have our lines. And you, at the moment, you cross, feel like you're crossing the line. And so that's why there's it feels like there's this real movement of like, kind of decentralization, um, you know, especially in money, when you think of like, say, crypto and stuff, that's a huge community who's like, you know, mm-hmm. screw you guys, we want to try our own thing. Um, yeah. But there's more to that whole space as well. That's not just about money or whatever. 
um, which is really fascinating, and and also that decentralized movement. But then it's also happening on a much more practical level as well. So there's there's movements out there, and they 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 call themselves like agora communities, where where they literally like they they set themselves up like like what you're saying, like okay, cool, I've got a I've got a piece of land here, and I'm I'm growing the potatoes, and you know this guy has a farm down the road, so we can get our meat from him and and our and our milk and whatnot, and 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 these things are popping up like all around, you know, so. The cool thing, and this is the hope and optimism that I always have about humans, is that like the human spirit will always kick in, you know, and you you can't put that fire out and we will come together. And I think there's a strong movement right now to doing this, you know, and if we can all play our part, you know, like you play your part, you specialize in what you do, um, other people will play their parts and ultimately you know, I think it might not be utopia, but like, you know, that we will kind of go back to um, just a, a better way of living and a better existence. So that's my optimistic side speaking. I really agree. I come a lot, of, obviously I come across a lot of clients that are investing in crypto, that are really interested in the decentralization and what's going to happen with the US dollar everything that we see that's bad in the world is driven by currency wars. You know, China is against the dollar and, and, and what's happening with Russia. It's all a, it's all a big power, um, a big power drive, you know, and it's not for the benefit of the people that are in the communities. And I think people have had enough. They don't want to participate in, in what's happening. That's, that's, that's not, that's quite frankly, it's not, not, not a very nice planet and not a very nice place to be. And I think that the fact that a lot of people are being, you know, are driving kind of change through what they can impact. And we're seeing an emergence, especially where I am in North Devon of bespoke pop-up kind of, um, food outlets and you know refill stations and you know we've got plastic free north devon and um, all of these incredible movements that are making positive changes all little nuances all kind of being being pushed forward by super spirited entrepreneurial people that believe that we can restore and create um, an amazing planet again. I think that is, you know, it is happening out there. And the more of us that can do that, the better. Um, you know, I talk a lot about the fact that we can't control what the government's going to do. We can't control interest rates. You know, the Bank of England at the minute is trying to control inflation by raising interest rates. And it's just, it's just not working, is it? It's just ridiculous, um, you know, to see how central government are losing the reins and uh, and that's happening around the world um you know we can't control that what we can control is what we do um by the kind of the ventures that we take by the spirited actions are the the causes that we pay into um by the little the little things that we do by buying local from our green grocers uh, you know by buying meat from the butchers rather than the big shop that has shipped it from New Zealand or wherever, you know, those mindful choices that we make makes us the dopamine hit that you get when you go and buy from your local market compared to like your click and collect, you know, by walking to get your child instead of jumping in an Uber, um, you know, all of those amazing mindful choices that makes life slower as well. Slowing down a bit. Let's slow down because life passes people say that life passes really fast I was listening to a podcast as well um by um um Stephen Bartlett you know the CEO podcast um and one of the things that uh, one of his experts were talking about was how we feel like time goes by really fast it isn't that time goes really fast we're just into all of these boring routines get up get up go to work nine to five have a weekend, maybe have five weeks of holiday. And then even when you're on holiday, you're just, you're never there because you're never present. You're thinking about work. When you slow down and you get hold of your brain <laughs> and you start to be present and you think, I'm going to walk to school or I'm going to take a cycle ride or I'm going to just look at 
the birds that are on my bird feeder right now or I'm going to look at the leaves just fluttering and it sounds really cheesy that's how you slow you t- slow your life down because we're just we're just not present enough and when you slow your life down you become more mindful you start to spend more time in in joy and in love and in what matters to us then we start to find space to save and invest and do some really fun things with our money because you really probably you stop spending money as well on autopilot um so it's it's super powerful and it's so simple to do that's the cool thing and i i think i really think your clients are super lucky that to have you um with this different way of looking at at money and and mindset and and philosophy and um what you said there is so important you know i think the world is so frenetic already like what can i do to one slow down uh but to simplify my life because life is complex enough as it is you know but one of the things i always try like do for myself is like okay cool assess what's going on gareth in your life what can you kind of remove like what can you simplify in your life because like you said because then actually it becomes much more enjoyable because you okay, I'm not gallivanting here and there and blah, 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 or what, whatever it is. I'm not doing this. I'm not doing that. Um, I'm now, I've now got more time to do the things I want to do, you know, like, you know, for me, for example, like uh, recently I had to make a hard decision with a podcast, which was to only publish episodes every two weeks, because I noticed that I was spending too much time, like, uh, researching guests, preparing for, for podcasts, um, to um to yeah to to doing all the post-production stuff as well when i really actually created the life that i that i have now to spend with my wife and my daughter like i want to be a present father like that's why i actually left investment banking it was one of the big reasons i left it's like because when i have a kid i want to be a father that is present in their life and and like that is one of my overarching and important things in my life so you know so something had to give. I was like, Gareth, you're not living in alignment with your your values and, and the way you designed your life. You've got to make a tough decision. And and you know, ultimately that, that's kind of like one of the, you know, one of the things that you've got to do. You know, sometimes something has to get sort of sacrificed, but but it must be in line with kind of like the life that you want to live. And um, and it's not a bad thing. I don't think people need to, to see it as a bad thing for themselves, you know. Um, these are good decisions even though they might be hard or, or whatever the story is, you, you have to, you have to do these things to live the life that you want. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, oh, I just really resonate with what you've just said, because that's exactly why I left investment banking was because I was like, I can't have a child here. I don't, I'm, I don't want to be the parent that gets a nanny that, you know, and that's, you know, some people that works for them. It just wasn't what I wanted. I wanted to have a child and really enjoy having a child. And then, you know, I realized even when I'd had Harry working for a big wealth management firm again, I couldn't, I, I was working harder and longer hours. And I was like, the only way I'm going to do this, if I, if I take matters into my own hand and I launch my own business. Right. Um, and that really, that kind of desire to be present with my family really it was behind the venture and then I've taken it that one step further and you're always trying to find that that kind of that 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 kind of purpose one of the first things that I do with new clients when we when we're starting to build a strategy is I I I do values I I elicit their values their financial values their life values and I ask them what 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 their wealth is all about and for me wealth is not about money at all your money is one part of what what you kind of your tools to wealth you you know there's three things that I look at when I'm looking at building wealth it's time energy and money that's what we play with but your wealth is designed by your well-being it's your energy that you have it's the abundance you feel it's your lifestyle and it's your time and your health that for me is the wheel of wealth I, I do I love diving into those areas and uncovering aspects of their life because usually when they have they're making lots of money they don't have well-being they don't have a good lifestyle they've their time short because they're trading time for money and we get really clear on strategies that can, can give them time and energy and money you know that we can leverage all of those amazing assets that they own because often we are giving away time and energy working for a corporate 
you know, because fundamentally, in order for a corporate to work, you don't get paid as much as if you did it for yourself. And you were went out there and kind of created a freelance opportunity or, or something that's, um, you know, going to, kind of going to give you a a one-to-many offering where you can you can serve a community and things like that so there's so many things that you can do to make money that gives you a a greater kind of more valued approach and you and also you kind of do it in your way as well on your terms in alignment with what you really want to be doing and that was really important for me I love the fact that I get to pick Harry and Rose up and I can't wait to like after you know I'm looking out of the sunshine right now and I'm like as soon as I as soon as you know it hits three o'clock my laptop is closed and I and I go and then I plan my week around what I can physically do um so that I'm when I when I go and get Harry it's all it's all about Harry and I do work in the evenings once they're in bed sometimes but I don't often do that because I'm so tired. I'm a morning person. I'm so tired at nighttime and I give myself a bit of of downtime. I love listening to a podcast or watching something on Netflix um, that's just going to help my brain to to have a bit of downtime as well, you know, because it it can get one of the biggest things I've kind of learned as becoming an entrepreneur is not working all the hours you know, and and not getting into the traps that you had when you were in corporate world, maintaining boundaries, learning when to say no, trying to like, you know, create a business that serves your time and energy. And and it's something that I'm still learning even now. And I love learning my lessons so that I can help and inspire my clients even more. If I'm not learning, then that's quite boring, right? I become, I could become out of touch (laughs) fundamentally. (laughs) Yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, I always like to, um, I guess, ask my own clients, like, what is the, what is the price of like autonomy, you know, like, and, and therefore what is the decision-making that you need to go through to get autonomy in your life? Like for me, I mean, autonomy is like, that's almost the most important thing in the world. You know, like I, I can't really think of anything else that's more important, like where you literally are in control of your kind of destiny, how you spend your time, how you spend your energy, like the facts now, like that uh, you, you probably the exact same that you don't have to like ask a boss, like literally uh, I've got to go pick up the kids. Is it okay if I leave the office early or, you know, I would like to go um, on holiday next week. Um, is that okay? You know what I mean? Like you don't have to do that. You don't have that kind of stress or worry um, and you can just do what you want. I think autonomy is priceless. And it feels really uncom- uncomfortable as well. When you start out, you're like, okay, I've got nobody to ask. And then so you end up getting into nine to five automatically and only taking four weeks off. Sometimes you have less time off than when you were in employment where they forced you to take your two weeks holiday. <laughs> I don't know if you remember the forced two weeks trading holiday that you had to have. Um, I've had clients that actually don't maintain that boundary they come into it because they want freedom and then they get they don't know how to be that boss for themselves because they get into the habit of hearing that subconscious boss telling you no telling you you can't telling you you're not allowed to have time off telling you you can't finish at three because if you finish at three you're lazy everyone works till seven right back in the day you People used to sit, I'm sure they used to sit on the trading floor till eight o'clock at night because it made them look good. I was out the door. I, I was actually quite good at leaving on time and thinking, do you know what? I'm I'm all about being as efficient as humanly possible so that I can be in and, and leave, you know, because I, I, I didn't, I never had that urge to stay longer than I needed. And actually it never served it, that, you know, I still got where I wanted to in my career. I think a lot of us hold on to those bad habits um, that we picked up through life. um, And then we don't because it, because that feels too easy. And actually I I can't earn money because it's hard to make money. And again, some of those beliefs about money come back where, and then you start to feel really uncomfortable. If you're making money and it's too easy and you're having an amazing life, you're there for your, for your wife and your daughter, or I'm there for, for my husband and my 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 little boy and girl 
mm, what am I doing? There must be someone losing out, right? No, no one's losing out because I'm giving my clients an amazing service because I don't have to have 200 clients to serve. I have a smaller number of clients that I really nurture um, and I set things up in a way that really works for me and I outsource the things I hate <laughs> I don't like doing social media for years I did my own social media as I was my business was growing now I have someone do my social media my blog my PR stuff um so that I can focus on being on a podcast so I can focus on talking to incredible people at networking events so that I can focus on writing that financial plan for that client that's paid me to um you know and I, it's checking in on that all the time and making sure that eventually you have to do the things, all the things, because obviously when you're starting out in business, you're getting things going. You have to do the things that might not be the most joyous, but eventually it's always checking in, right? What do I love? What don't I love, but needs doing in my business? If, it, if you don't love it, but it needs doing, that's what you outsource. If you're doing something that you don't need to be doing and you don't love, that's something that you cross out. You know, you talked about doing your podcast every two weeks. If you were doing it more than that, you didn't need to be doing that. And it was creating that. It's it's always checking in on those boundaries, isn't it? And always checking in on what you need to be doing, what you don't need to be doing. What do you love? What you don't love? What can you outsource? What can you keep doing? It was really interesting. Recently, I chatted to somebody that um, wants to start working with me who says that a business coach told them that they shouldn't be going to events anymore that they they should be in the office because they are now the manager of the business they should be getting somebody else to go to the events and I said well, but what brings you joy what do you love doing I love the events okay then outsource the office but <laughs> to me it's a no-brainer to do always what you love because if you do what you love you will get out of bed in the morning. You will be there. You'll be you'll be showing up with that energy, with that high vibe, that vibrations that people love. Your business will thrive, and you outsource the the bits that you don't love. Who wants to be stuck in the office all day if that's not what they want? Some people love the office. Some people love doing that. So you find the people that love doing that, <laughs> and you. It's so important to listen to what what you really want and to check in and constantly call you know question your processes and I think we don't do that enough sometimes we we forget to have maybe that quarterly review because we're not in corporate anymore you know we think oh I can't have a quarterly review with myself that's ridiculous I don't have a boss now have a quarterly review with yourself go and get a really nice you know you know box of chocolates or kind of you know when we used to have team meetings we used to get all the stuff in and put it in do that for yourself make it really enjoyable to have that quarterly review block your diary out and spend some time reviewing where you're at you know or do it with uh, someone like me you know or, or, or another person that you can work with a mentor you know it's so important to do and so fulfilling when you do it I think, I think it's that's just fantastic advice you know like that's the one thing that I notice as well like you know with with people that I work with is that nobody assesses their own lives really you know and they, they don't they don't plan they don't think about what they're doing um and it's just like I always say to my clients I'm like I'm actually not really going to show you anything too fancy if I'm totally honest with you right everything I'm going to show you is really simple but I know that because you are human, you have almost probably never done this for yourself. <laughs> and, and that's what it is. It's literally like, cool, I'm going to sit down and I'm going to uh, write about what are my values? You know, like, what are they? Like, have I even thought about this before? Have I thought about my childhood? What, what happened in, in the past to me? How it's impacting me now? My decision making, my thought process. Do I have any kind of trauma around it? Like, um, what are my goals? Do I, do I even know what they are? What is the next step with those goals? Like, it's like, it's honestly the most simple stuff in the world, but humans just don't do that because one, I think so many people are just stuck in this sort of rat race and also everything is go, 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 go. Like you were saying early on, like we, we just need to slow down a little bit. We need to slow down. We need to simplify. We need to do these assessments. And it's, um, it's just, it, it, it's actually fascinating how we don't, 
do it to ourselves, you know, but we'll probably do all these things. If we work for a corporate, we'll, we'll do things um, for them um, that we never do for ourselves. So it's, um, so yeah, it's really, really interesting. And it becomes quite negative, doesn't it? It becomes quite negative in the corporate world, like your annual review, you dread it, mm, right? For sure. We dread the annual review. So we dread doing that for ourselves, but we change, well, we want to make it positive. Yeah. Super positive because actually how can you know that you are, delivering on your goals if you don't review your goals now I, I I realized this month like I I set goals for my clients every quarter every month goals and actions that are about life business everything you know giving you time and energy and I was like I've not done my own goals so I was like I sat down I was like I haven't done my own goals for June I got really clear on what I'm going to do in June to make sure that I keep myself on track. And I really believe everyone needs a coach. So I have a coach. Everyone needs a coach. Everyone needs, um, you know, someone to guide them through their life, to keep them accountable, to check in with them. I really believe, I believe it. You know, I, I, I love the fact that, yes, I'm a chartered financial planner, but I'm a, I'm a financial coach. I'm a, a business coach. I'm a life coach, whatever you want to call it. I, I, you know, I, I, fundamentally I'm here to pe- hold people accountable to live in their best life whatever that looks like and I have a coach because I wouldn't be authentic if I didn't have a coach so you know I have a coach that I work with that keeps me accountable that's ahead of me or to the side of me to, that's going to push me to that next level and that's so important for not just for business I do, my business my coach isn't just a business coach my bit it's it's so much more than that you know I think we all need to have someone that's gonna help us and it's it, like you say it's a lot of it is really simple but it's having that time for someone to listen to you and often to replay back what you don't notice that you're saying yeah that's great advice like having someone that you're almost accountable to you know and especially in this space where like you you know you're working for yourself like because once again humans are actually quite lazy <laughs> and um and we definitely don't know everything that's for sure so um having somebody there who's you know two steps ahead of us or experience what we've what we want to experience um and to to hold us accountable to things and to kind of reflect back and that is like is really 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 um important it's empowering and it's it's very it's it's much needed um, and it, it's a great investment too, you know, like don't underestimate, it might seem like, oh, it's a lot of money, but cheapers, the, what it gives you, like, once again, you, you actually not, can't always quantify that, you know, like, so, so it is a great investment to invest in yourself, you know, always invest in yourself in, in whatever it is. Um, so Emma, just as we kind of like sort of start finishing, finishing things off, um, something I'd like to ask everybody uh, which I found like a very useful question lately, even just for myself, is what two books have like sort of influenced you and your kind of like outlook uh, or philosophy on life? Really good question. I am never good at remembering book titles. Um, but, you know, oh, actually, I, I've got, can I, I'm going to get, I'm just looking at my book collection over here. Um, so Go ahead. Number number one, I think one of the let me just grab it. So, the Chimp Paradox. I read. I got. I got given this book um, when I was on the trading floor, and that was my first kind of insight into the mind that we have this inner chimp. And I, I quote the Chimp Paradox annoyingly, probably to my husband all the time. <laughs> like that's the chimp. <laughs> it's not <laughs> and the more I delved into it you know the chimp paradox it, it, it was groundbreaking at the time you know when Steve Peters came up came out with some of these concepts about about kind of how we behave and, and things like that so that was probably the first book the second book was um um atomic habits um atomic habits again you know because I, I read that book as part of my financial coaching certification a few years ago we are literally on autopilot all of the time. And if you have bad habits, not only do those bad habits not serve you, 
but you are missing out on so much success as well. And I think about this with my little boy. The, the biggest habit you have is brushing your teeth in the morning. It starts your day. Or it could even be when you get out of bed and you make your bed. You make your bed. And my husband's always like, Emma, you're obsessed with making your bed. I'll be trying to make it when he's in it because it's my habit. I'm like, oh, can you not do that? I'm trying to make the bed. If I don't get into a rhythm with my habits, my day falls apart. If I don't brush my teeth at a certain time, I then forget my face cream or I forget to put my mascara on. All of these little habits are so important. And then I think, you know, one of the biggest things that I kind of changed for myself is I really looked at the habits that I have that aren't serving me you know, the, the habits that I want to create difference. So, you know, in the morning, my habits are, I love to make a cup of tea. I get up and I have my cup of tea in the morning. I have a lemon water before my cup of tea and I try and do healthier things in the morning. I then spend time with my children. I walk them to school. If James walks, I then take Rose and then I make sure I walk the dog, you know, Doris. Um, you know, all of these habits I then make sure I don't look or get into work until 9 a.m. I don't have my first client session. I try not to until 9.30. And I, and I make sure that I, in my in my, in my my day, I, I'm quite hyper-focused when I'm at work so I can, I can shut off in and get things done. Um, but fundamentally, what was lacking in my life was the lifestyle habits of making sure that I stop for lunch, that I stop and I you know, I just walk around with my shoes off and I put my feet into the grass and then I go for a walk. So I can't wait after this, I'm going to walk to school and I'm going to listen to the birds and Atomic Habits, amazing book at really thinking about how you can create new habits, you know, because it can take 28 days to six months to form that new neurological pathway. If you're not successful, if you're not happy, your habits probably are the things that you haven't got. Beliefs are harder to change, the inner chimp brain, which is why the two books are quite interesting. It's harder to rewire your beliefs than it is to create a new habit. And creating a new habit can create a new energy. Energy is everything. So I think those two books for me were were amazing for me to, to read. I've read other books since, um, you know, and it's always getting a little bit deeper. But I think starting at that basic level was really interesting. I find them very easy to read as well. Oh, can I throw in a third book? Of course. Wim Hof's book. I'm really getting into cold exposure. I did the Wim experience last year. Um, and that again, it gave me the belief that I can do anything, that I can get in the sea, even though I don't want to be cold. So a third book I would say is the Wim Hof book, you know. <laughs> Um, I don't know if I can swear, but he says a lot about you You just effing breathe. We don't breathe. We don't stop to breathe and to slow down and just to do things that nature intended. Get um, high on your own, own supply. That's what he always says, doesn't he? <laughs> yeah, he is such absolutely. a... <laughs> he is such a great guy, Wim Hof, I must say. Um, so, so thanks for mentioning him. And the other two, the other two are really great books as well. I really like this one graph in the Atomic Habits book, which is like, if you do like one sort of, if you create one good habit a day, the kind of, it gives you the trajectory, like on like just how, you know, amazing your life can be sort of in a year. And then the, the, it's like, it, it's, it's much worse if you do like one bad habit a day. Do you know what I mean? Um, and it's like, like you said, it, it's a simple book to read, but you know, some of the illustrations and the explanations are really like ah oh, wow like aha moments you know you're like wow okay cool um flip i need to change things up so yeah thanks for mentioning those really cool um oh, you're so, welcome. <laughs> so emma what um what have you got coming up like what are you excited about um for the future like just it could be in terms of yourself or um your business and uh, where can people uh, get hold of you yeah, really great question. So um, I've got a workshop that I'm running this month um, called the Wealth Manifestation to Creation Workshop. And I'm trying to just reach more people to help them to that can't maybe afford to work with me one to one. And the idea is, is that I run this workshop quite regularly um, so that people can come to me for a day, get really motivated, set those life changing goals, create a financial plan. I show people how to do their own financial planning. It's so easy. And then go away with 
an action plan for the next 12 months to 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 say you know to, to create that abundance in life and in in financial terms so that's coming up on the I'm running it on the 20 21st of June how people can find me they can just they could just message me um emma at my independent um and in life I've got scuba so I'm part way through my scuba paddy because I did I set those life changing goals. Um, so yeah, so I'm 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 doing the scuba diving. So I'm part way through. I'm about to do the op- open water paddy in Bristol in a, a very cold ex quarry. Uh, so that by August I'm going to be at Lundy Island swimming with those seals. I can't, I can't wait. What was What was really key to that was, was the fact that I set the goal that I would swim at Lundy. If I hadn't set that goal, I wouldn't have got clear on what I had to do to take my paddy because there were certain courses that were only available. But because I made that commitment in January, I had to say no to some things that I wanted to do this year. I got invited to a retreat in Jersey in July. I couldn't do that and do the paddy. I chose the paddy because I realized I always prioritize work. If I went to Jersey, I couldn't do the paddy. I was like, I can't do it. I had to say no. I was like, I'm so sorry. It felt really hard. I felt really nervous. I felt really sick doing it because I was like, I'm going to be missing out. But I was like, no, this this is really, my life is taking number one priority. So setting life-changing goals and committing to yourself will make you know it's that's what I that's what I've been doing this year it's been so so important and I'm hoping to launch my own podcast later this year so watch this space I'd love to return the favor um you know I'm I'm hoping to bring the wealth society podcast in September October time so that I can carry on sharing my message um about what wealth is and what it isn't and how more of us should have it and kind of current current carrying on to create the ripple and create the, the impact that I want to have in the world. So that's some of the things that are on my horizon wow. over the next that, few that's months. A, <laughs> that's, a, that's a lot of the exciting stuff. And um, honestly, the scuba, once you, once you are comfortable being underwater, it is the most amazing experience, you know, and you know, eventually, I guess you'll be going on holidays, hopefully to the Maldives, you know, with your family and the scuba there is just incredible. You know, I mean, even snorkeling there is, is incredible. Um, and, but, but there's just something about that calmness of being underwater and just in this world, that's kind of like almost unknown to us. Um, there's, there's just something so amazing about it. it. It's funny, just a quick one. You mentioned that you want to swim with dolphins um, about, yes, I think it must be 10 years ago now. I was in, I was here in South America when, when I went on a sabbatical from RBS and, um, I had, I had did an ayahuasca ceremony and then the next day, uh, cause we were deep in the Amazon jungle in Peru. Right. And then the next day we went, um, onto the river, the Amazon river, and, um, we swam with pink dolphins. It was Honestly, I thought I was still going crazy from the ayahuasca the night before. (laughs) I was like rubbing my eyes. I was like, what? And there were pink dolphins there. It was truly remarkable. So you're going to have just the greatest time when you do see those dolphins. They're just pretty amazing. I think I'm going to be, I just won't think it's real. You know, those sorts of life-changing experiences in nature, you know, it has to be in nature for me, not in anything that's unnatural there's just nature just blows my mind completely and yeah that's what it's all about I'm I just yeah I, I just can't wait I can't wait any longer for these things to happen and why should we why should any of us wait for those life-changing experiences exactly that live with us forever because you can feel it I remember seeing a blue whale go under my boat when we went to Sri Lanka and the blue whale swam right under this rickety old boat and it blew my mind and the this oh I just remember it like it was yesterday and that's what that's what keeps us human right ridiculously human <laughs> I'm sure that your heart skipped to be between that um incredible but, 
Yeah. So, so just the last question then is what does being ridiculously human mean to you? Oh, I think being ridiculously human is just being ridiculously present in the moment. Just, yeah, just enjoying everything about what is right in front of me. You know, I think stepping off of this moment with you right now and going and walking to get my little boy and feeling the breeze on my face and walking with the with Doris the dog and just being in in the here and now um yes I want to be in the ocean yes I want to have those experiences and you know that's important but actually what's important is just being in my own body and being right here in, in 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 this present moment i think that's what for me being ridiculously human is all about that's super cool um em, i just wanted to say like a, a massive thanks for for coming on the show like honestly it's just been it's been such a wonderful chat seriously like uh it's so crazy when you think about it like you you go through so much of your life like i mean i guess we we worked together for quite a long time like you know career wise and you almost don't really know people, you know, a lot of the time. Um, and that's been one of my lessons with the podcast is <clears throat> we go through life and we, we don't necessarily know the people that are even our good mates well enough. And we, we need to make a conscious effort to kind of, you know, ask deeper questions and, and find out more about them and their life and their stories. And honestly, it's been so awesome <laughs> chatting with you today. Um, but I'm also like, <clears throat> sorry, it's clear my throat here. Um, I'm also like really proud of you, like, you know, and, and I just, I don't say this in like a horrible way, like condescending, whatever, but like a, a big brother or whatever sort of way. But like, I'm just really proud of, uh, of you and like what you've done and achieved uh, as a person. And I'm really excited for what it is that you're doing and what it is that you're trying to achieve and that you offer people. I really think the way that you think and your kind of philosophy uh, to money, to mindset is very different to almost probably most people that do the job that you're doing. And anybody that goes and works with you is extremely lucky. So thank you so much for coming to the podcast. I, I actually really look forward to, to listening to it again. I think there's so many value bombs dropped in there by you and i know people are going to love listening to you so it's just been a great chat emma thanks a lot you're welcome thank you so much for having me cool <laughs> all right emma <laughs>